Please welcome Lee Zenderovich, Assistant Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Zenderovich is a public health researcher and feminist social demographer, focusing on global sexual and reproductive health and rights, race, and gender. Her mixed method research focuses on contraceptive autonomy, exploring the ways that new approaches and measurements and evaluations can promote person-centered care, health equity, and reproductive freedom. Uh, for why I do what I do. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can take the, the population control out of family planning measurement and measure population control instead. Um, so why should we care about family planning? Why do people care about family planning to begin with? And it turns out that there, there are some strange, strange bedfellows in the world of family planning. Different people come to family planning for really different reasons. So I'm sure a lot of this looks familiar to you all. There's, of course, a, a feminist rationale for, for family planning. Contraception is part of a broader um, agenda of reproductive rights. There's not. Um, an environmentalist rationale for family planning to protect biodiversity, um, to alleviate climate change. Um, many of you may have heard about an economic rationale for family planning as a way to reduce poverty both at the, I don't know why there's timing on this. It happens often when I present it, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, an economic rationale to both promote, um, uh, to reduce poverty both at sort of like the family level at the individual level as well as uh, to improve GDP and uh, and uh, promote the economy at the at the macro level and then of course also a public health rationale my training is in public health um, to improve maternal and child health through uh, lower fertility and lower parity and this is just an example I guess the the type is pretty small here um, but I'll highlight a few things for you this is an example of the way that folks talk about family planning in the in the global health world um, family planning is quote the smartest investment that we can make capable of improving outcomes and everything from HIV AIDS to education to sanitation to malaria as well as bringing significant savings across sectors. So you can see here the way that family planning is portrayed as almost like a silver bullet, right? A, like a panacea, a cure-all for the multidimensional challenges of global poverty, um, environmental problems, ill health, right? Unsafe living conditions, all of these things can be improved with family planning. And with all of these benefits, right? Like, look at all, look at all that family planning can do, and so few stated downsides, right? You don't see anything here um, uh, to indicate otherwise. Um, the 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 challenge for family planning has been framed as how can we get contraceptive uptake to the highest levels possible in order to maximize all of these benefits. But of course, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you all that that family planning has not always been a liberatory project or an emancipatory project for all people since its inception, but rather it's been tied in with a range of projects to control both fertility overall, as with the population control movement, and also to decide whose bodies are targeted for fertility limitation. So uh, many of you, um, I'm sure, are familiar with the eugenics movement. In the US, the eugenics movement targeted the bodies of minoritized racial and ethnic groups. Um, people with disabilities, people living in poverty, among others, for compulsory sterilization. I always like to show this picture of Fannie Lou Hamer. Many of you may be familiar with her from her incredible work in the civil rights movement and voting rights. Um, but in my world, Ms. Hamer is uh, best known for popularizing or getting us familiar with this slang term, Mississippi appendectomy. Um, which was a, a slang term that women in the U.S. South used, black women in the U.S. South used to describe their involuntary sterilizations at the hands of white doctors. So you go in for a Mississippi appendectomy and you come out without the ability um, to, to procreate. And this happened to Ms. Hamer herself. She was given a non-consented radical hysterectomy in 1961 by a white doctor when she was undergoing surgery for a small tumor. Um, many of you may be familiar with what we call the reproductive justice framework. This is a framework that was developed um, by black women here in the U.S. in the mid-1990s in response to this history of racialized reproductive oppression um, here in the United States. Um, and I'd love to spend a lot more time on reproductive justice, but for now I'm just going to say while it's an increasingly influential um, framework here in the U.S., in the global south we're not really talking about reproductive justice very much. 
So if we turn our, our attention to the Global South for a second um, and start to think about sort of what is going on there, um, it's important to think about how um, after the Second World War, neo-Malthusian concerns about global overpopulation were really central to the birth of the international development sector. So the US Agency for International Development was founded in 1961. And that very same year as its founding, it began funding family planning research. So it, it began funding family planning the very first year of its existence. And again, the type might be a little small here, but this is a screenshot from the USAID family planning website. And you can see how Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon so Democrats and Republicans, all motivated US um, development assistance for family planning as a way to control overpopulation in poor countries. So for example, President Johnson said that he would seek new ways to use our knowledge to help deal with the explosion in world population and the growing scarcity of world resources. And President Nixon called population growth one of the most um, serious challenges to human destiny one of the most serious challenges to human destiny. So given those like apocalyptic stakes, right? The world's gonna end if we don't control population. Um, the legitimacy of, of coercion in the pursuit of fertility decline was frequently affirmed throughout this era. Um, the president of a very influential organization called the Population Council published a paper in 1979 um, in which he wrote that there are undoubtedly cases of justified coercion, but he cautioned that overt violence or other potentially injurious coercion is not to be used before non-injurious coercion has been exhausted. So it's okay to coerce people to get their fertility down, but let's try to hurt them not a, a, only a little bit as, as opposed to um, hurting them a lot. Um, and many countries in the global south adopted population policies during this time that included things like economic penalties for high fertility, um, quotas for providers, and compulsory sterilization for women. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into uh, detail about what you're seeing here, but we, uh, there's an example here from Singapore and actually a, a fairly recent example um, from India. Um, and of course, uh, none of this has gone uncontested, right? So feminist scholars and uh, anti-colonial scholars, anti-racist scholars have been um, contesting uh, population control and eugenics from the beginning. Um, and so here you can see an example of a uh, poster created by San Francisco-based ar artist Rachel Romero um, in the mid-1970s to contest the forced sterilizations that were going on in California at the time. But really all of this came to a head, this is a little bit of inside baseball or around family planning, but all of this came to a head at a big conference that we had in Cairo in 1994 called the International Conference on Population and Development. And this was sort of like the conference that was supposed to end population control. And so you can see here that in the Lancet, which is like a big fancy medical journal, um, they talked about how the Cairo conference really signaled the end of the population era. So it's over, 1994 is when it ended, and we have this thing that they call the post-Cairo shift, in which um, this population control focus on fertility reduction and demographic targets is supposed to be replaced by what we do now, in theory, which is focus on reproductive health, reproductive rights, access to quality of uh, high quality services, um, and gender equity. And so this is really the conventional wisdom, is that this Cairo conference phased out um, the old rationale for family planning and phased in this new rationale for family planning. Um, but I'm going to show you a few examples of state-sanctioned contraceptive coercion in the years since Cairo. Um, there have been efforts to control fertility overall, like the one-child policy in China that was in effect until 2016, or sterilization camps like these from India, which were also um, operating through 2016. There have been efforts to focus on ethnic minorities and particularly to target indigenous groups, like this example from Peru. There have been efforts to focus on people living with chronic diseases. This is an example from Namibia in which women with uh, HIV were targeted in 2012. Examples where people of color or in particular women of African descent are being targeted, like this example from Israel from 2013. Examples where trans folks are being targeted, like this example from, I think, this, it's uh, widely practiced throughout Europe, but I believe this example is from France in 2017. Examples where poor people are being targeted, like this example from Australia from 2014. Examples where people with intellectual disabilities are being targeted, like this example from the UK um, from just a couple of years ago. 
And I really had my choice of examples from the US. It's not hard to find many, many examples from the US, but I landed on this one um, from Tennessee from 2017 in which a judge was offering reduced jail sentences um, uh, in uh, exchange for um, people agreeing to get sterilized. So if you think about what we have here, we have examples of state-sanctioned contraceptive coercion from every inhabited continent on the world. I feel like if we just got a few more people on Antarctica, we might have some examples from there as well. Um, targeting just about every type of marginalized group you can think of, right? Across axes of race, ethnicity, gender, class, disability, geography, and more. Um, and so my work really seeks to interrogate, I'm gonna go back for a second. My work really seeks to interrogate this idea that like we've made this shift. And I try to think about the ways that actually this ideology of population control and this eugenics ideology um, still really permeates contemporary fam family planning programs around the world today. Um, and so the central questions that guide my research are, what happens to people's experiences if and when um, family planning programs are, dr are driven by fertility goals, which they very often are? And how can we design family planning indicators um, that measure and promote the post Cairo agenda of reproductive health and autonomy. And I focus on indicators because in global health in particular, we are obsessed with targets. If we don't measure something, set a target and make progress to that target, we will die. Like that is our oxygen, we need it. Um, and so we're, if we can um, stop measuring fertility and contraceptive uptake, and start measuring contraceptive autonomy and reproductive freedom instead, we can really transform how our programs um, are designed, evaluated, funded, right? All of these things that you see here that are tied to, to um, quantitative targets. So I focus on um, the role of quantitative indicators and I'm working on how we can design new, new quantitative indicators that measure and promote this post Cairo agenda of uh, reproductive health and autonomy. So I'll, as always, really thank the funders of my work, and then thank you all so much for listening. Thank Happy to be here. Thank you for supporting the 4W initiative. The 4W Fall Forum and Social is a change-making platform to bring people together on pressing issues around gender and well-being, and also cultivate leadership and community among scholars and students. The event commemorates the 175th anniversary of the University of Wisconsin-Madison as it highlights past and current scholarship related to gender and well-being. Connecting the vibrant history with the present, we will feature early career UW faculty to share their work with the audience through a half-day forum that includes flash talks, interactive sessions, and a networking reception.